Last week, if you recall, our subject was the providence of God. And um, I told you then, Lord willing, that I wanted to have one more lesson on that. And so this is part two then of the uh, providence of God. And we talked then the meaning of the word providence from um, two words. It means to see before, to forethought, or, or foresight of something before it happens. And so there, we pointed out too, there are two types of divine providence. One is the general providence that God uh, shows or has over all mankind, of course. Uh, we looked at the verse in Matthew 5, 45. He makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. We also pointed out that the civil government is part of that general providence of God. From Romans 13, verses 1 and 2, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God, so that's his providential watching over them. And then a rather interesting verse we read last time, Proverbs 21, 1, The king's heart's in the hand of the Lord, like the rivers of water. He turns it wherever he wishes. So God is in control of our government, so to speak, of the powers that be. We saw that he provides for animals, he provides for plants. And so this is the general providence then of God over all of creation. But we spent most of our time upon the special providence of God. So what is the special providence of God? It's the overall biblical concept of God's special care over his own. Those who are living in harmony with his will. Christians. And so that's where our emphasis will be. I also want to point out again what it is not. It's not God working in opposition to uh, the Bible, his inspired word. It's not miracles <clears throat> like the feeding of the 5,000 by Jesus. Miracles uh, suspend natural laws while the providence of God uses natural laws to carry out the, his goal. And so it's God blending then the natural circumstances of life together for the good of his righteous people. Now, we looked at several scriptures. I want to read just a few to remind us of this special providence that God has over uh, those that are living in harmony with his will. Psalm 37, verse 25, I've been young and now I'm old, and yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Psalm 55, verse 22, cast your burdens upon the Lord, and he will sustain you. He shall never allow the righteous to be moved. And then Psalm 46, verses 1, 2, and 3, God's our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its dwelling. I will not fear, he says. And then, of course, Romans 8, verse 28 and 29, we know that all things, are for those who love God, all things work together for good to them who are the called according to his purpose. And remember, as we'll point out later, he says it's for those who love him, all things work together for good. And we saw that the proof of our claim to love God he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandment, John 14, 15. Now, there's, there's an aspect that we may not have thought about, and that's our prayers. Have, have you stopped to think when our prayers, so many of our prayers, if we'll analyze it, we're asking God to, God to providentially uh, answer those prayers. Let me just, just uh, illustrate here. Uh, we pray for such things, you'll give us a safe journey to our home. Well, how's God going to answer that? Providence of God? What about that uh, the preacher standing up say that, uh, you know, you have a prayer and say, help him to remember well the things that he's prepared. Well, how are you going to, how am I going to remember well the things I prepared and for your prayer to be answered, would it be in the providence of God? And what about we pray for the, the sick? Uh, so how's God going to do that? Miraculously or providentially? And I would say providentially. And also that he'd be with our loved ones. Uh, please, even the Lord's Supper, we, we pray, please help us, Lord, to partake of it in a 
right manner. Well, how is God going to answer that prayer? If he answers it being providentially, wouldn't it? Or help us to win souls, help the church to grow. How is he going to bless us and answer that prayer to help us get out and try to win souls and the church to grow? Through his providential help, I believe. Now remember, we're talking about the care and the superintendence that God has over the righteous. I sure don't want to mislead in that. He has never promised his watch care to be with those who are not righteous. This special care is for those who are adhering totally to his word. Now, I want to look then at some examples both in the Old Testament and the New Testament of what appears to be, in some cases it's just more than just appear, you can see that God's hand is in it, but at least appear to be uh, an example of how God has worked in the Old Testament and the New Testament in a special providential way. Well, as it turns back, and as it turns out, we can look back and see, yes, that was the providence of God working that spared the Jews. Now, another excellent example, and I'm just almost sure it has to be the providence of God, and that's with the man Joseph. And we all know who Joseph was. He was the son of, uh, of Jacob. He had this son in his later years, and he had a special love for him. And in fact, almost too much it would seem, the Bible just simply says that Jacob uh, had great love for Joseph. And so, you know, he made him a coat of many colors. And uh, Joseph also had some dreams. And in those dreams, that he, he, dreamed, he dreamed that his brothers would be bowing down to him. And of course, he shared that dream with his brothers and and that just made them uh, dislike him even more. They were envious of him and jealousy, uh, jealous of him already. Now we read in uh, Genesis 37, verses 3, 4, and 5, the statement. Now Israel loved Joseph. Israel would be, the, would be the same there as Jacob. He loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. And also he made him a coat of many colors, Dolly Parton. I had a song on that, you remember, about the coat of many colors? It was based on this, this story. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. So you have the jealousy of the brothers. Then his brothers were out keeping the flock, and so... Uh, Joseph's father said, I want you to go out and, and go where they are and take him some, some things here for them. Well, when they saw him coming, you know the reaction, if you remember the story, they said, there's that dreamer. And they didn't like him. They were envious of him and jealous of him. And so uh, they decided they'd kill him. But the brother, one of the brothers, Reuben, said, no, do not kill him. Let's just throw him in this pit. And so they listened to Reuben, and they threw him in a pit. Uh, shortly after that, there came some Midianites coming by, merchant men. And so they sold Potiphar to these merchant men that were going by, going down to Egypt. Now, Genesis 39, verses 2 and 3, says the Lord was with Joseph. And he was a successful man. And not only that, when they got to Egypt, they sold him to a man by the name of Potiphar. And he was an officer in Pharaoh's uh, court there in the legal aspect of Egypt. So here in Genesis 39, 2 and 3 again, the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a, success, a successful man. He was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master, this Potiphar, saw that the Lord was with him, and the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. But then, as you recall, uh, this uh, Potiphar had a wife, and it said that, that uh, Joseph was a fair, well, we'd say a handsome person, I guess. And so she began to look at him, and finally uh, she tried to seduce him to commit adultery with her. And then, so in Genesis 39, verses 8 and 9, we have this very pleasant statement. He, that is uh, Joseph, 
refused and said to his master's wife, Look, my master does not know what's with me in the house. He has committed all that he has into my hand. There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. But that's not all he said. And I wish the world and our young people could hear this one. Then how can then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? That's what we ought to be hearing in the world. How can I commit adultery? How can I commit fornication? When I know I'd be sinning against God. That shows you the integrity of this, of this uh, Joseph. So we have the jealousy of his brothers. We have him sold into slavery. We have him prospering there in Egypt. And we have that sexual temptation. And then we have unjust punishment. He's thrown into prison. And we find him, there were two people thrown in prison also, and that was the baker and the butler. Uh, and so Joseph interpreted their dream. Now, the butler is going to be restored to his position, but Joseph said that the baker is going to lose his head. The way I remember the two, which one is the baker or the, or the butler, uh, the, the baker was cooked, so to speak. Will that help you kind of remember which one lost his head? And so the baker. But in Genesis 40, verses 14 and 15, uh, he was speaking to the butler, uh, Joseph is, and he said, now he's been restored. And he said, but remember me when it's well with thee, and please show kindness to me. Now, listen closely. And make mention of me to Pharaoh. So he said, remember, now I want you to make mention. Joseph said, make mention to me to Pharaoh and get me out of this place. For indeed, I was stolen away from the land of the Hebrews, and also I have done nothing here that they should put me in this dungeon. Help me get out of this prison. Well, see, the hand of God doesn't work the way we would think sometimes. Two whole years pass. Joseph is left there in that prison. But then two years, and it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, now has a dream. And then the butler says, oh, oh, I remember now. I remember my fault. He says in Genesis 41, verses 1 and 9, I remember my fault today. I forgot to tell him about Joseph interpreting my dream. But he tells the, the king, and so... Uh, it results in that Joseph interprets the dream that Pharaoh has. And he tells him that a famine is coming. And uh, because of the dream and interpreting, he exalts uh, uh, Joseph to next in line to him, the king. And the famine comes, as you know. Joseph's father's, uh, father and his brethren were still living in Canaan. Of course, they got hunger for food as well. And, you know, the story is pretty long, but they send one down and uh, two or three down. And finally, uh, says, bring all of the family down. Pharaoh says, bring your family down. We'll, we'll put them in the best place here in the land of Egypt. Then uh, the really exciting part of that story is when Joseph reveals to them that he's their brother. They didn't recognize him. It had been all that long time. But here's what he says. Joseph speaking to his brothers who had sold him into slavery and sought to kill him. In Genesis 45, verses 4 through 8, And Joseph said to his brethren, Come near to me, I pray. I pray you. And they came near. He said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me hither. Now listen closely. For God did send me before you to preserve life. For these two years has the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in which there should be uh, neither earring nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for us in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. And now listen to the rest of it. And so it was not you who sent me here, but it was God, and he made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. 
Then in verse Genesis 50, beginning in verse 19, Joseph said to them, to his brothers, Don't be afraid, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. See that? God meant it for good. In order to bring it about, as it is this day, to save many people alive. So Joseph said, I know you meant evil, but God was using it for good. Now, therefore, do not be afraid. I'll provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. So what an interesting story. You just see the hand of God working it all out for, his, uh, for what he intended for it to happen. But look what he used to do. It. He, took, he took the anger or used the anger and the envy that his brothers had. He took the lust of Potiphar's wife. He took the forgetfulness of Pharaoh's butler, two whole years of forgetfulness. He took the gratitude of Pharaoh for interpreting his dream. And he took that seven-year drought and using all those things to bring Jacob's family down to Egypt. Small family, about 70 or so. But as you recall, they grew and grew and grew and became a mass of people, the Israelites, that finally were delivered from the Egyptian bondage. That's the hand of God. So, divine providence. I hope you'll tolerate this, but I, I typed out 13 things. 13 reasons why the people of Israel ended up in Egypt. It's retrogressive. It goes backwards. Try to, try to follow me. Number one, because there was a great famine and Egypt had food. Number two, because Joseph was the second in command in Egypt and stored food from the good year. Number three, because Joseph interpreted Pharaoh's dream. Number four, because the butler suggested that Pharaoh call for Joseph. Number five, because Joseph had interpreted the butler's dream two years previously. Because Joseph had been thrown into prison. Because Potiphar chose to put him in prison. Because Joseph was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. Number nine, because Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him to adultery and Joseph was a righteous man and he fled from her. Number 10, because Joseph was over her husband, Potiphar's, uh, his, his house. Number 11, because Potiphar had, had uh, bought Joseph as a slave and God blessed him and gave Joseph a good work there. And number 12, because Joseph's brothers sold him to this trader for 20 pieces of silver because Jacob, his father, was partial. And Joseph's dream caused his brothers to be envious. And because Joseph that morning, or, or um, his father that morning, he got up when he made that decision to send Joseph out to his brothers. What a cumulative effect that decision had. Ultimately, ended up in the saving of the people of Israel in the land of Egypt. Now, did those things just happen? I don't think so. Now, but let's, let's, let me just talk a little bit about this divine providence. It's not about God controlling uh, our every action uh, to get his way. It is, on the other hand, God taking our choices and our works and bringing those together for a greater work, as Philippians 2 verse 13 says. It does not require miracles. Now, admittedly, there were about two things in this long account that had a, a, a miraculous element in it. But they don't seem to have totally affected the behaviors. And so it was non-miraculous, basically. Now, here's what I find interesting about this. Did you know that God planned for... This whole plan, God knew about it before any of this ever began to happen. For instance, in Genesis 15, listen. A few hundred years earlier, a few hundred years earlier, God appeared to Joseph's great-great-grandfather by the name of Abraham. Now listen what he told him in Genesis 15, verse 12, beginning. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, or Abraham, and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said to Abram, or Abraham, 
Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that's not theirs. We know that's Egypt. And will serve them, and they will afflict them for 400 years. That's exactly what happened, isn't it? And also the nation whom they serve I will judge, and afterwards they shall come out with great possessions. Who are all this? The Israelites. But if all these other things we looked at had not happened, then Jacob and his two boys would not have ended up there, would not have had these massive crowd of Israelites as they grew and grew for 400 years. But God knew. And he knew it ahead kind, and he used each step by step by step by step to make it happen. Now, let's go to the New Testament for some instances in it. I read last week, Acts 8, verse 1, Paul, or Saul, as it's called here, you know, he converted, became Paul. He was consenting unto his death. That's Stephen's death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Therefore, verse 14, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Providence of God, great persecution came on the church, and literally everybody left that town of Jerusalem. How many were there? We were know on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 were baptized. We're talking about a lot of people there. Everybody left that town because of persecution except the apostles. And yet, you'd say, well, that's going to end the church. It actually turned out to the church massively growing. The hand of God. Another thing that's interesting, Paul's prayer uh, was providentially answered. In Romans chapter 1, verse 9 and 10, he's writing to the church at Rome, Paul is. He says, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Now listen to verse 10 making request, in other words, praying, if by any means, not length, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come to you. So he's praying that through God's hand, he'll be able to go see them in Rome. Well, he did, but do you remember how that prayer was answered? Well, here are the steps. Paul returned to Jerusalem, and he was arrested in Acts chapter 21. God appeared to him by night and tells him that he must bear witness with, of him in Rome. Now, this was a miracle of him appearing, but it doesn't seem to affect what happened. To save his life, the Roman leaders then takes Paul and over to Caesarea by night, Acts 25. And then Paul is put in prison at Caesarea for two years. Finally, he appeals to Caesar. He says, I'm a Roman citizen. And so I, I said, I want to appear before Caesar. And of course, they had to do that. An angel appears to Paul by night. He says, thou must stand before Caesar. And finally, in the spring, Paul arrives in Rome. His prayer is answered. Is that the way Paul expected that to be answered? Two to three years down the line. But step by step, it did. And so the depth of the riches and the wisdom of God. Now, Paul is a prisoner at Rome, you remember. And so he writes in the Philippian letter, chapter 1, verses 12, 13, and 14. He says, I want you to know, brothers, that what happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. What happened to him, he's there in prison in Rome. He's guarded by guards all the time. So that it has become known throughout all the whole imperial guard, the Roman guard, and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And then many of the brethren, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So the providence of God, you say, Paul in prison, that's horrible. But he says, look, what's happened to me here in prison has made the other brethren more bold, and now they're going out and preaching the gospel, the providence of God. Now, a word of caution, and that is don't, uh, don't interpret every success we have as as God approved, uh, and not ever failure as disapproval for God. Because you know that wicked men like Haman, we mentioned earlier, uh, may prosper for a period of time. Good men like Job may suffer some difficulties for a period of time. That doesn't mean God turned his face on Job. He did it for a while, for a purpose. 
and refrain from being too dogmatic and saying, I know that this is the providence of God. I know that no, I do know this probably. I don't think anybody here believes more in the providence of God than I do. I believe it so much and I have for many, many years. Uh, can I prove it that these things were the providence of God? I can't prove it, but I am so convinced. See, we don't know all those answers, but I knew I've seen God work in my life providentially in such marvelous ways. I believe it 100%. So last week we had that verse. For we know for those who love God, all things work together for good. Brethren, it doesn't say some things. It says all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, and we saw 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14, we're called by the gospel. Those who love God, those who are called by the gospel, he says all things will work together for your good. And so, as I mentioned last week, how wonderful it is uh, to believe in and, and live by the blessing of a special providential blessing from God. One more time, Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. Do not worry and do not be anxious about, what's that next word? Anything. Don't worry about anything. Don't be anxious about anything. That's a command. But in everything by prayer and supplication with, remember what that other one is? Thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passes all understanding or comprehension will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. If we will follow that, if we worry about nothing, trust God in everything, and count our blessings, life will be wonderful. It will. So as I mentioned at the close last week, and I will today, uh, it will eliminate worry and anxiety from our lives that conquers so many people. It will replace that worry with a peace that literally passes all comprehension or understanding. You say, I just don't know how, but I have such a peace of mind. And eliminate that word luck. And some of you said last week, you know, I, that's, that's good because, you know, we say that's just luck. And no, it's not luck. Not where God's people are concerned. Uh, we'll take that word luck out of our vocabulary and say we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. So count your blessings and be a wonderful, faithful Christian, putting him first in everything, and then relax. God will work everything out for us for our good. So I want to ask you as I close, have you obeyed that initial command that puts you into Christ. You believe that he is that Savior who died for mankind. And you're convicted of sin. And, and then that causes you then to have a repentant spirit. And you're immersed in water. And you come out of that water, this new creature in Christ. No, you're not. So many of us were baptized into Christ. You're not in Christ until you're baptized. Therefore, we're buried with him in baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, that we also should walk in newness of life. Where does the newness of life start? It's after we come out of the water of baptism. If we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we'll be also in the likeness of his resurrection. If you've never obeyed that initial command, you need to do it and become a Christian. Most of us here are Christians. So I would ask you, have you kept Christ first in your life? To the extent that you have a total trust in him and his word and that you have this constant awareness of this marvelous providential care. Remember the eyes of the Lord open to the righteous. His ears are open to their prayers but the face of the Lord is against those that do evil. Can you reach out and claim this blessing from God? I will work everything together for your good. Everything. If you put him first and serve him 100%, we can help you. Won't you respond while we stand and sing? Amen.